I've been journeying through the amazing book of Romans and uh, we're up to Romans chapter 6. So if you've got a Bible or you've got a device with a Bible on it, just turn to Romans chapter 6 and I'll read some verses in a moment. I've called this uh, Made New, nearly called it uh, Sin. I want to hate it because it's... uh, Today's all about sin and I know Christians can tend to go to one of two extremes when we, when we talk about sin. We know there are some Christians who are like, you know, we don't drink, we don't dance and we certainly don't go to the cinema. <laughs> and uh, there are other Christians who you know, play games with sin and I think we're much more likely to be on that extreme. Wanting to be evangelistic, wanting to be cool, wanting to be out there, wanting to relate in a world in need and wow, the object of the exercise is that we learn to hate sin more. We hate what it does to us. We hate what it does to other people. And most of all, we hate what it did to Jesus. That we never want to sin. We never want to sin. And the first three chapters of Romans that we've been looking at in this room over the last months uh, paint a picture of our human condition. Point out the fact that we are wretches. Lost and hopeless. It's dark stuff. We're separated and there's literally nothing we can do about it and we're heading for a lost eternity. It's all there in the first three and a half chapters of Romans. But in the middle of Romans chapter three, praise God, there's a divine but. God did something. He took the initiative, sent his only son, the only one who can make us righteous because he lived a righteous life, the only one that wasn't living with the sin curse And he died for our sins. And through his death and resurrection, we can be made right with God because of his amazing grace. And in chapter five that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, he painted this beautiful picture of the new people we are. Once we're born again, we're justified by faith. We're made right with God. We're standing in his grace today. There's fresh grace and fresh mercy for us today. And we have happy certainty of heaven to come. Boom. Anybody glad about those things? All because of Jesus, not because we deserve it, but because of his amazing grace. We are so rich. And in some ways, the first five chapters of Romans have been a lot about two words. The first word is justification, about being made right with God. And glorification, about because of that, We can have a happy certainty of heaven when we die, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, with no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. The future's bright. 100 years time, wait till you see me. I'm going to look belting. And I'll be with Jesus and it'll be incredible. However, this new and wonderful teaching of God's grace And all about what he did, not about what we have to do, not having to earn our salvation, must have been hard to take for the religious posse 2,000 years ago. There were people who were all about rules, all about jumping through endless hoops to try and earn your way back to God. How hard for the Pharisees, how hard for the religious Jews to hear this new teaching of grace and how they opposed it. That Paul said it's all done. There's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. And uh, he even said in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, he said, the more we sin, the more grace there is towards that sin. And I'm sure there were, you know, Romans 5, 20, the law was brought in so that trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. And with it came... This criticism, oh yeah, Paul, so if that's right, let's all sin. The grace may increase, you kind of get the logic. Let's just do whatever we want and then we can just turn to Jesus on our deathbed or we can just every day turn to him and just live as we want. And Paul is like, no, you've got it so wrong. You haven't got the first understanding of what it truly means to be a Christian. And so he he goes for it in Romans chapter six. Let me read the first 14 verses. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who've died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Don't you know that all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. 
For if you've been united with him in death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin may may be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ... We believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. So much in there. I went away with Sam and uh, Olivia and Mabel a couple of months ago and now we were staying in this nice log cabin thing. And uh, often when you stay in these Airbnbs, there's a bunch of books on the side you know help yourself to people who read the books left them there and on the side was a book by a fella called Moby who anybody heard of Moby okay Moby was a massive star at the turn of the millennium he had the biggest album of the year an album called Porcelain and um, but before that he had a, f- a faltering career in the 90s and then uh, he made an album that was an absolute flop called Animal Rights and he thought his career was over and he put this last chance saloon and 30 people turned up at the launch of his album called Play but then a the radio started to play one of the tracks and then more and more of the tracks got licensed and he sold 10 million copies of this album and he was headlining every festival. He was uh, doing massive arena tours all over the world, sellout tours, night after night after night of these huge arenas. And But the reason I was interested was because I was like, I'm sure I heard Moby was a Christian. And uh, he was a Christian, wasn't he? Yeah, he played Greenbelt and everything uh, when I was a lad. And, uh, and he'd written a book on the bookshelf, here it is, called then it fell apart how about that i wonder what that's all about i thought moby the christian was he a christian or not i think he was and he's written a book called then it all fell apart wow this book is a cautionary tale it's the story of a prodigal son once he got his fame he thoroughly decided forget christianity i'm gonna go all in all in chasing more and more fame all in chasing more and more debauchery, sex, sex and drugs and rock and roll. He even says this shocking thing. But I mean, in some ways, he's being transparent and honest, isn't he? He says, the more attention I got, the more I wanted. The more I got of everything, the more I wanted. I wanted more touring, more press, more alcohol, more invitations to celebrity parties and more one night stands. My life was perfect and I wanted it to go on exactly as it was. I still prayed every morning and sometimes I even cautiously asked for God's will to be done. But what I really wanted was God's will to be done as long as it involved me being famous. <laughs> and isn't that a picture of so many Christians Act in some ways? I want God's will to be done. I've got the name of a Christian, but as long as it fits in with my lifestyle. And so basically, he blows up. He becomes a multimillionaire with a five-story penthouse in New York and crazy debauched parties. He's he's the guy everybody wants to know. And even though he's not such a good-looking guy, lots of girls want to have sex with him. And it's it's horrible, actually. But then his album... His album Porcelain sells 10 million copies. He brings out another album called 18. It sells 4 million. And then he brings the next one out. It sells 100,000. Suddenly, nobody wants to know him. Suddenly, he's not getting the same invitations and he's not getting the same buzz out of fame because what Satan does is he always, when we give in to sin, he always wants, it's always more to get the same hit. It's always more to get the same buzz. We're never satisfied and he's always got one step down for us. So listen to this, right? One of the saddest things you'll ever read. I needed my fame to stay exactly as it had been at the height in 2000 when I walked out of my front door on Mott Street. I wanted to hear people talking about me. When I entered a party, I wanted everyone to look at me. Once I'd love visiting the magazine store at the corner of Prince and Sullivan to look for mentions of me on glossy full colour pages. But now 
I did my daily Google search of my name. I was furious. The journalists and the radio programmers and the hipsters who maligned or ignored me didn't know what was at stake. They didn't realise that the consequences of their disdain was that I was becoming less famous. It would take such a small effort on their part to write good articles about me, to play me on their radio stations, to invite me to their parties. All I needed in order to be happy was for them to love and support me more. So profound, isn't it? So basically, he then desperately tries to get invited to every party going. And he has a line. He has a line in the sand. I'm not going to take cocaine. I'll take every other drug. He's seen what cocaine's done to his friends. He's seen the nightmare, but eventually he gives in. And the first night at this party, he takes cocaine and he's feeling absolutely appalling in the bathroom. And he says this, I sat in the filthy toilet and the cocaine fully hit me. My eyes rolled, my jaw clenched, and my sin felt like it was covered in dirty electricity. I leant my head against the graffiti-covered wall, tapping my teeth together and grinding my jaw, and I started laughing. I used to teach Bible study. He taught Bible study for eight years. I used to teach Bible study, and I said out loud, tapping my sweaty, bald head against the wall. I was by myself in a strip club in Times Square on a Tuesday night, drunk, wearing a hideous shiny suit, voiding my bowels and doing a bag of street drugs given to me by a stripper. I laughed harder. I used to teach Bible study, I shouted. Finally, after years of trying, I'd lost my soul and it was funny. And of course it wasn't funny. It was horrible. Satan had seen step down after step down after step down. He'd given himself over like a prodigal son and he was living in a pigsty. And the rest of the book is a horrible story of more and more cocaine, more and more alcohol, until he's just in the pits of despair. And the book finishes. This is a laugh a minute book, isn't it? The book finishes with him in a pool of vomit, lying in the street, out of his mind, no friends, thoroughly lost. And it finishes like this. I had nothing left except panic and sickness. I'd been the rock star. I'd been the king. Fame and wealth were supposed to have protected me and given my life meaning. They were supposed to have healed everything, but I'd failed. Fame hadn't solved my problems, and even my last loves, alcohol and degeneracy didn't work anymore. I settled into my metal folding chair and thought, I'm done. The tension left me as I sank into defeat and started crying. I raised my hand, still unable to look at the room or meet anyone else's eyes. I didn't want to say it, but I knew it was true. I'm Moby and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> what a horrible, as I say, cautionary tale of the, the law of sin. But Satan is always getting you on his hook to pull you further and further and further away from God. But that is not what you're called to. How sneaky the enemy is. What a terrible place to be. To have known you're a child of God, but have chosen to go against his will. Especially when you have a new nature. When you become a Christian, you're given a new nature. Uh, here, over here, on my left-hand side, I prayed with a fellow called Vincent, who gave his life to Christ on Friday, on Sunday at church. And myself and Jane Sullivan prayed with Vincent. And, and uh, he prayed the sinner's prayer, and we prayed to be full of the Spirit. You know what he said? Ooh, I feel brand new. I love that. That was just the third, first thing that came out of his mouth. And uh, I was like, you are brand new, Vincent. You're born again. You've got a new nature. You're a new man. The old man has died and you're born again in Christ. And you've got power to live right. And if you will co cooperate with Christ, instead of being a slave to sin, you become what the Bible calls a slave to righteousness. And when you're a slave to righteousness, that service is perfect freedom. There's another um, pop star who had a flirt with Christianity called Bob Dylan. You've heard of him, haven't you? And Bob Dylan brought a couple of stonking Christian albums out in the past. And my favourite track on, on uh, his first Christian album was, you got to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil, but it may be the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. And Bob's absolutely spot on. We've got to decide. And even as Christians, we have to decide who we're going to serve. Who are we going to serve? Are we going to serve the devil? Are we going to be the old, the old guy? Slaves to sin? Or are we going to be servants to righteousness? Servants to Christ? Servants to the Lord? 
Paul's re reply to his critics is amazing. It's that God not only forgives your sins through his grace, but grace does something even more. Grace doesn't justify and glorify, doesn't just make you right once and for all and give you a place in heaven for an all eternity. Grace actually sanctifies. There's power through the grace of God, through his daily mercy, his daily refreshing as I surrender to him to become more and more and more like Jesus with a deep-rooted hatred for sin, what it does for me, what it does for them, what it does for Jesus. And he uses the picture of baptism. And again, this Sunday, Vincent gave his life to Christ and we had four spectacular baptisms. We've got a picture. Yeah, this is these two, Jill and Ken. And Ken's had significant major health issues, had a major brain tumour. And carrying, but what a beautiful thing when that man and woman who came to Christ through the grocery. Well, in fact, he, Jill's faith was rekindled and then Ken gave to Christ. And they've now signed up for the Eden team, which is so exciting here in Withenshaw. But we also had this girl, Ruby. Ruby was in a wheelchair a few months ago and was wonderfully healed. And then um, went on advance the scattering, leading people to Jesus and praying in faith for people on the streets. And she got baptised. And we had this guy. Mo, wow. No, not him. That's good. Him. Mo came along to this church because he, he was in significant trouble. Some heavy, heavy crimes he'd been caught for and he was going to court and he knew he was going to prison and his mum and dad had been coming to this church and he said, I'm going to come along to try and get a reference that I can read to the judge. Thought coming to a church would be a good place to get a reference. So he came along just wanted to get a reference because his trial was coming up. He came along, heard the gospel, gave his life to Christ, thoroughly, thoroughly transformed. And, there was a, and, he, and, he, went, and he went to the court, went to prison, and for the last 12 months has been this spectacular witness for Jesus. In prison, came and he had the opportunity to get baptised in prison. He said, no, I want to get baptised, my first opportunity at Message Community Church. And all his family were here. Oh, it's so amazing. You couldn't, really get, you couldn't really get four more different people, actually. And yet, they are all the righteousness of God. They've all experienced the transforming power. And that when God looks at them, each one of them, he doesn't see what, he used, what they used to be. He sees Jesus. There's no power like it. Listen to this, verse 4. You died with Christ. You were buried with with him through baptism, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of God, you may live a new life. And Paul cuts to the chase. He says, we're dead to sin. We're alive to Christ. In the same way, count yourselves as dead to sin, but alive to, alive to Christ. It's a command of the Bible that we need to live in the light of every day. We are dead to sin and we are called to be alive today to Jesus Christ. Therefore, we must offer our bodies as what the Bible calls instruments of righteousness to please God. We must hate sin and love what's right. We just haven't understood the gospel if we don't. So I, um, whatever, 40 odd years ago, became, a, well, really, I made a commitment when I was 12 years old and there. Uh, flirted with Christianity for five years but then really was all in at 17 and I truly gave my life to Christ and all I wanted to do was tell people about Jesus and my RE teacher religious education teacher was called Basher Forbes and he announced me as the worst pupil he's ever taught <laughs> I don't know whether I was but I know I was a naughty boy at Mosley Hall Grammar School and when he heard that Andy Hawthorne had come to Christ and was witnessing on the streets and going around the pubs telling everybody about his new conversion he said you need to come in and spend a day and I'll bring in all my classes every year in one after another and you can just share your story because he was a full-on Christian you probably whether you'd be allowed to do it and the invitation wasn't like teach something off the national curriculum it's just come and preach the gospel Andy I've only been a Christian I've only been full-on for Jesus for a while so this is my first experience of school's work and I was a bit daunted by it and I thought Okay, well, you know, I could tell me testimony for 10 minutes. Maybe I could do 10 minute question time, although I don't know the, all the answers, but perhaps God will help me. And, and, uh, and then I thought, I know what I'll do. 
I'll play a Christian track. <laughs> and I was trying to find decent Christian music and there wasn't much around. The one band I really loved, and I'm going to play you this track in a sec, was they were called Andy McCarroll and Moral Support. I bet you know heard of them, have you? The Irish new wave band, right? And, uh, but they wrote this track and my favourite track of theirs was called Sin. <laughs> and so I said, I'm going to play you a track all about sin. And I want us to discuss what Andy McCarroll says about sin. And what do you think about that? You know, what, do you think it's just a bit of naughtiness? Or do you think it's serious before God? And I played the track, sat down, and they must have thought I was a lunatic. But I'm, I'll, I'll tell you when to cut it off, because I don't want to play it all, but you'll get the idea. So let me play a few minutes. So imagine 45 years ago, me and a class of bored-looking year 10 at my former school who've been told, here's the worst pupil who ever went to this school, and he's now telling them all about Jesus. And now I've heard this track, and I want you to listen to the words. So today, we're going to do the same thing. I want you to listen to the words message, because I think there's actually something. This Andy McCarroll's written in this song that is so insightful and so amazing. When I listen to it again for the first time for decades, listen to this. Okay, so what did Andy McCarroll say, class? <laughs> he said he wants to hate sin with all he is. He said sin's like a cancer. It's an ugly disease. He said sin kills. It corrupts your brain. It's like poison in your veins. It's like living in a sewerage drain. Oh, what do you think about that, class? Well, that's what the Bible, he says, it's a secret of fools. It's a death trap from the father of lies. I believe that with my whole heart. I believe that guy's in this funny, cheesy new wave song from 40 odd years ago. He's onto something. We need to see sin for what it is. It's disgusting. It's horrible. My Jesus had to go to the cross because of my terrible sin. But certainly... This is what Calvin said, Christ is much more powerful to save than Adam was to ruin. We're living a life of ruin, but Christ is more powerful to save. Listen to what Paul said in a couple of his other letters. He said in Colossians 3, verse 9, you have taken off your old self. That's what happened when you became a Christian. You took off your old self with its practices and have now put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of its image, the creator. In Ephesians 4, he said, with regard to your former way of life, put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires. Be made new in the attitude of your minds and put on the new self, created to be like God in true holiness. Honestly, 
If you just joined, you won't have heard me say this. If you've been around for years, you have heard me say it many times. The most important thing you bring to the message is not your great speaking gift or your creative gift, your dancing, singing, rapping, or your great administration or your skills or accountancy. The most important thing you bring to the message is your holiness. I'm set apart for Jesus. I'm going to hate it. I'm going to hate sin. I'm going to live for righteousness. I'm going to live up to the man I've called to, I'm called to be in Jesus. And honestly, if we had a group of people who truly treated sin like it is and truly knew that only life and joy and the Holy Spirit comes through righteousness, through pursuing righteousness, we'd change the nation. If we were truly set apart for him and our desire to please Jesus and live right and it doesn't mean being boring and guess what? You can go to the cinema. You can dance and drink and party. It's all right. But you passionate desire is never to displease him it's never to displease him you want to live life to the full with Christ in charge and that's what he's inviting us into let's just stand together Lord I just pray that we can be a people more and more who hate sin oh we hate what it did to us and what it's doing to others We hate what he did to you, most of all, Jesus, that you had to pay such a great price because our sin was so great. But thank you that we've been baptised with you. We've died to sin and we've risen with you. And we're alive. Help us to be alive to right living. Help us to be alive to you, Jesus. We choose you today. We set ourselves apart in this great and glorious adventure. Thank you that... There's not just power to be justified once and for all, power to be glorified on the final day, but there's power today to be sanctified, to live right. And we receive your power and we ask in this room there'll be conviction. Anybody watching online, anybody in this room, me, Lord, if any area I've been playing games with sin, we repent of that and look to you. You want to take us from one degree of glory to another. We have an enemy who wants to take us down and down, but Jesus, you are so much greater. Rule and reign in our lives. Give us a passion for holiness like never before. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You've been watching Message Live. And we hope it's been a great encouragement to you. Would you subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, and ring that bell for notifications. And thanks for watching.